I'm so glad you came today to hear what Julie Komnick has to say about her work. There's been a lot of discussion in the gallery about um, the continuum between art that is merely pretty, art that's beautiful, art that is effective because of composition, uh, style, color. And I have to say, this, this show is so powerful because Julie is not only a consummately skilled painter, but she paints with such passion that uh, her work is, is, uh, has, carries her images forward. And uh, I, I welcome you all to, to the show. I'm very proud to have this ex exhibition in the art gallery. Before um, actually giving Julie the stage, I want to mention that the next exhibition is the student jury show. And it opens on April 14th. And um, you will start registering on April 1st, sorry, April 3rd. And so be ready for that. The prospectuses look like this. I hung this show with two students, Clyde Ewald and Valerie Rieger, and also the help of Laura Blumenstein on the faculty. There's no way we could have gotten this show up if it had been just me. Uh, <laughs> Obviously. So uh, I really, really appreciate student help in hanging a show, and there's lots of opportunity during the student jury show to come on in and help out, and you'll get to see uh, from the walls out uh, how a show comes together. Julie Komnick is on the Arts and Letters faculty at Prescott College. She got her original degree at Evergreen State College in Washington State and her MFA in Montana at Montana State University. Um, she teaches both uh, history of art, she's teaching a course now called Art on the Periphery, and she also teaches studio courses in uh, drawing and painting. Did you do 3D also? Uh, yes. yes, a multi-talented <laughs> woman to be sure. Um, and again, I, I hope you just Join me in giving Julie a big, big welcome to the yeah, Psychology. Thank you for coming. Can everyone back there hear me? I know there's something loud over here. It'll go on and off. <laughs> this is definitely an audience I'm not used to. At Prescott College, we have classes of 12 and we sit in circles. So if any of you feel like moving about, I'll be more comfortable. But in the meantime, give me some signal if you can't hear, and I'll try and talk loudly and slowly, which is also a difficult task of mine. Um, I know that this audience is a nice range of students from both Prescott College and Yavapai College and a lot of community members, which is wonderful. So I've tried to gear my presentation um, somewhat towards students and to kind of cover the path that I have taken from being a student to where I am now as an instructor and painter and drawer. Um, and also to just to talk about um, some of the concepts behind my work that I'm dealing with and then hoping that a lot of the discussion can come from your individual questions at the end of the presentation. So as I'm going through this, if anyone has specific questions about the artwork I'm covering, go ahead and ask, but otherwise there'll be lots of time for questions at the end. Also, yesterday I switched from slides to digital technology with my own work, so hopefully this will go smoothly and I have a remote. So, we'll see if that works. So, um, I think one of the difficulties of giving a gallery presentation is we're already surrounded by the artwork. And I think as an artist, at least I like to believe that the artwork speaks for itself. You know, it's, it's difficult to stand up here and give an explanation of a piece when you like to think that the piece is serving that function already. So, I'm going to start by talking about um, the work that led up to what's in this gallery now and then move more into um, the concepts I'm dealing with currently. Um, and also talk a little bit about my background at the same time. So I was I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. I uh, went to college at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. And when I went to college, I knew I was interested in studying a combination of, where's that cursor coming from? Um, of art and environmental studies. And as soon as I started at Evergreen, I found myself more interested, I was still taking art classes, but more interested in um, American studies, so a combination of American history and literature, the types of things I was interested in depicting or portraying in my art. 
So I ended up um, studying more um, humanities background along with taking art classes. After Evergreen, um, I knew that I wanted to go to graduate school to pursue visual art, specifically painting further, but I also needed to take some time and put together um, a portfolio at the graduate level, do some other things, worked at a frame shop for a few years, um, and needed to put together an exhibition record. So um, when I was in Seattle, I joined up with a couple other artists. Um, we were a little frustrated with not being able to have a space that would support our work. The choices were either coffee shops or professional galleries, and without a you know, significant exhibition record, it was really difficult to show your work at um, the, the more professional types of galleries. So we started um, sort of a cooperative community art space um, that helped us um, with our own professional exhibition records, but also to show a wide range of work throughout. I'm just going through some of the slides that I did um, after Seattle when I went to Montana State University for graduate school. Um, when I was looking at graduate schools, I'd gone to a somewhat alternative undergraduate institution, and I knew that that was kind of the philosophy of education that I supported. Um, but I was also interested in seeing what the more traditional college institution was like. And so I was um, applying to a combination of you know, state schools and art schools and ended up going to Montana State University, which I was attracted to because the graduate program was really small and there was a lot of, um, it was really close-knit between the sculptors and the painters um, and just a really supportive environment. And what I also appreciated about being at that state institution is I still had access to the subject matter outside of the visual arts. So I worked closely with mentors in religious studies as well as architecture and American studies. So still learning about the types of things that I was starting to um, depict in my artwork. And it was at Montana State that I started um, recognizing my interest in this notion of absence in my work. Um, when I first got to Montana State, I didn't really know what I was painting about. Like I had all these things I'd learned and didn't really know how to, um, whether I was depicting them outright or trying to generate metaphors or allegories. So kind of struggling there a little bit. And I ended up making a couple paintings where I was just like packing the paintings full of stuff, like piles of antlers being in Montana, piles of antlers in parking lots. I guess antlers was the main thing that I was filling my paintings with. And it became apparent to me that what was happening by filling the paintings with this, you know, one constant type of thing, the other elements within those paintings, whether it was people or other objects or animals, became um, isolated within that stuff. So then I was kind of realizing, oh, what I'm doing is isolating these subject matter elements, drawing associations amongst them, and that was kind of what was most successful in my work. And so I kind of took that to the other extreme of getting rid of everything else, recognizing that um, taking out what you're used to or accustomed to seeing causes you to draw associations between what's been left behind, hence the notion of absence. Um, so these first few pieces are kind of coming out of um, what I was doing in graduate school. And after graduate school, um, again, one, once again, kind of in limbo, um, I needed to decide where to go next. I knew I wanted to teach, but I also felt like I'd been in the institution for a few years. I wanted to see what it was like in the real world. I wanted to um, try out some museum work and decide if teaching was really what I was cut out for. I'd been, do, I'd been teaching as a, a teaching assistant um, in graduate school, but you know, kind of wanted to explore some other things before I devoted the rest of my life to an academic institution. So, moved to Chicago, um, worked at the Field Museum of Natural History in exhibits. Um, so, I was interested in the museum side of that, but I was also interested in, again, being surrounded by the types of things that I was dealing with in my work. So, conventional notions of natural history or contemporary notions of evolution, things like that. And I was also teaching um, at community art centers. The Hyde Park Art Center in Chicago was really supportive and exhibiting my work and um, kind of networking, making connections with um, other artists and galleries there. <clears throat> um, 
So I think this is a good point to start talking about um, the development of the imagery in my work. So as I've been talking about, you know, I've been in situations where I've been exploring the subject matter and then how to decide what to put in images that will get those ideas across. Um, sometimes um, I'll have a theme that I want to deal with in an image, like a specific, whether it's a, something social or something personal, but you know, kind of an, a broad idea that I'll go and you know, seek out types of imagery that will support that. And other times, it'll be an object that I'll come across that will spark an idea. Um, this piece, January, is an example. I uh, got that little Christmas tree stand in Montana, and I'd been carrying it around and using it as a paintbrush holder for a long time. And I just loved that as an object. And um, I really wanted to do something with that. So I, I started thinking, you know, what is the function of a Christmas tree stand? What, um, what types of things does that bring up? And then where does its life sort of end? So that brings us to January. Christmas is over, you know, then what is the function of the Christmas tree stand? For me, it was a paintbrush holder. But then, um, but we have really specific associations with that object, and then when you take it out of that context, what new associations can it bring up? <clears throat> um, these next few images are followed by slides of some of the visual references I used to create the paintings. So this piece, Cadence, um, you know, I, I, this is an example of when I had a specific theme in mind I wanted to deal with and I didn't know what type of subject matter or objects and people would make that up. I was interested in the concept of um, when you've mastered something, what do you do next? Or if you put that away and start over, what does that look like? Or what is the feeling behind that? Um, my mother is a piano teacher, grew up with piano lessons going on in our living room. So it's kind of haunted by the baby grand piano growing up. And I've always loved that as an object. So those kind of came together here. Um, originally, for this, the idea, I definitely wanted like a messed up baby grand piano. But I was envisioning it being um, a male figure in it wearing a tuxedo, older fellow, kind of the stereotype of a conductor guy. And then as I started thinking about it, um, I really like the idea of a female wearing a dress that could simultaneously be you know, worn for a concert or a funeral, things like that. Um, so for this, I worked primarily from photographs. Ideally, I'll work from a combination of you know, photographs or actual models or 3D objects. The con with, this, with this piece, well, besides the pile of dirt, um, most of the things were unfeasible to have in my studio for an extended amount of time. So um, this woman, Ashley, kindly volunteered for exchange for dinner to model. So I had to set her up in kind of a position that, so she could actually be digging in a hole. And then the piano reference came from a, a book on earthquakes and natural disasters. And I think this is a tornado in Nebraska that had whisked away the piano and liked it as a reference. Um, and then this piece, Communion with Vacancy, again, it was the object that I was initially, initially attracted to, um, the confessional. Um, I was on a trip to Oaxaca, Mexico, and was in an old church, and this confessional was there. And I photographed it, had this kind of blurry photograph that I carried around for a while, and eventually realized that what I liked so much about the confessional as an object was the fact that it was vacant. And kind of, you know, how does that relate to a confessional? And thinking about is the nature of a, actually, you know, giving a confession more a matter of actually saying it and admitting it to yourself, or is it a matter of being heard? So what is the significance of the vacant confessional? Interesting. Um, and so these are the references, some of the references for that. And within the confessional, just over there, there's a lot of little details that I work from actual objects. There's a rosary. Um, those uh, red things. What do we call those? Yeah, those. Um, right, so those, you know, I, I work from, from life. Um, so it's kind of composites of various references. Um, Candidly, by this drawing that you can't see. Um, the pallbearers, you know, again, setting up people or working from photographs to get a sense of the objects that I'm dealing with. Yeah. 
And uh, moving ahead to my most recent work, I've um, been thinking about themes of, or the nature of the exotic and what we think of as the exotic and how we tend to um, subjugate certain groups or cultural influences uh, in order to support our notion of the exotic. Um, and the references for this. So again, working from a combination of things, but this is an example where, you know, the elephant, I did research on um, poaching of elephants for tusks. You can see, you know, I, I'm not necessarily working from one photograph, I'll often use a composite of photographs in different things. And what's great about working at Prescott College is the faculty are committed to volunteering. <laughs> and Ship had no idea what he was getting into by offering to um, model for this. It once. So the next handful of slides here are other artists that I look to that I'm interested in. Um, not necessarily in the medium they're working with or the style of their artwork, but I'm really interested in the way that they set up the narratives in their work. So the first artist here is Jeff Wall, a contemporary Canadian artist, photographer. And the way he um, stages his photographs and inserts little ironies in the staging of them. And Ed and Nancy Keenholtz, collaborative sculptors. Um, again, the way they use commonplace types of objects in their artwork to, bring, to, to create associations um, dealing with a lot of social and more political issues. Another installation piece of theirs. And Kara Walker, a contemporary artist, um, her work is made out of cut paper. So she cuts you know, these silhouettes out of paper and then installs them life size or larger than life size on the wall. And um, a lot of issues dealing with stereotypes from the antebellum south and then how that relates to contemporary culture. And again, I'm attracted to the way that she sets up these narratives or fragments of narratives and um, makes you look closely to get the meaning out of the piece. And creates these you know, wall installations out of that. <clears throat> Another artist, Juan Munoz, um, dealing with the nature of absence and being really specific of just really including minimal things to um, give you a sense of a place, dealing with hotels or apartments with balconies. And then um, he does drawings also, and I really like the style of his drawings in the same way. And um, moving into drawings more so now, um, Jim Dine's drawings I'm really interested in and the way he um, leaves a lot of things unfinished. <clears throat> and um, contemporary South, Ameri or South African artist, William Kentridge, um, who creates film, animated films out of his charcoal drawings. And um, the, the drawing that's left over from the process of making those animated films has a lot of erasure marks and shows a lot of the movement. And the rest of the slides, not this one yet, um, are of my drawings. So this, this show here is predominantly paintings, but I do drawing simultaneously with my bodies of paintings um, to bring a little, bring them in, to kind of, you know, bring them in. <laughs> um, so we're backing up a little bit. These first drawings are coming out of graduate school and then coming more into the present. <clears throat> and, yes, Heather. Do you do all your drawings on the school, like, on campuses? I do. That's a really good point. Um, some of the images, oh, the question was, do I do all of my drawings on the scroll-like large-scale thing? Um, 
And earlier when I was showing the, the reference images, some of those were just like photocopied straight out of my sketchbook. I'm really horrible with sketchbooks. I don't really draw on them. I make little notes or little thumbnail sketches to remember stuff, but when I sit down and do a drawing, it's always pretty large scale. Um, and I consider them you know, finished pieces in and of themselves. They're not studies for paintings, necessarily. Um, I think they're similar to my paintings in the sense that they're still like fragments of narratives or, and draw associations between or amongst different elements. Um, but different in that they're really about the association between two or three elements rather than, you know, a sense of deep pictorial space or somewhat. That's what that is. Oh, the last one. Can I go backwards? This one. Habit. So back in Montana, surrounded by wolf imagery in the local galleries, um, I guess I was thinking at the time about the relationship between the beast and the symbolism of the beast and culture and racism and the hooded thing and then little dead bird. I, that didn't explain that at all to you. <laughs> I, you know, I just told you what the elements were. Um, this piece I'll explain a little more though. This is custom. Um, this came about, some of you have heard this story like 5,000 times now, but um, um, a lot of these drawings have vultures or birds or raptors in them, which I was really interested in a number of years ago. I'm still interested in them, but not as obsessively. And um, doing some research on vultures, looking for visual references in National Geographic magazines, and came across an article that explained um, a festival that happened in Peru. I'm not sure if it still happens. This magazine was like from the 1950s. Um, and in this festival, it was the tradition to capture a California condor, which is the large species. Uh, virtually extinct, a vulture, and capture one of those, carry it upside down, alive through this procession of this parade, and then beat it over the head of the stick at the end of the parade until it died. And I was just kind of drawing a connection between that and the um, custom of the pinata at parties, and then, you know, Western or American use of pinatas now. And so those are little bits of wrapped candy coming out of the head down there. Um, Jack B. Nimble. So Heather brought up the, the scroll-like format, um, which I'll talk a little bit about. Yeah, so the paper I'm using for this is just this rolled paper. It's Strathmore 400 series. Pretty inexpensive. Um, so it's nice because you can start on a drawing, and if it doesn't work, you can rip it up and throw it away, and it hasn't cost you a fortune, which is really nice. Um, the other part of these is um, I hang them in the scroll format because part of it's from being a picture framer for so many years that I really like just seeing plain exposed paper without glass in front of it. And on the scale, it's, you know, more economical. And also you can just roll them up to ship them, which is nice. However, they're not protected, so it's kind of a sacrifice you have to make if uh, it's good idea not to have it show in a space that also has yoga it comes off the wall. <laughs> it's happened. It's happened. Um, so I guess um, to kind of close the slides, there's just a few slides left. Um, again, going back to, you know, I think the, the common theme that ties these various kind of little bodies of work together is, again, this notion of absence by, even in the paintings and the drawings alike, by leaving stuff out again, causing you to draw associations between things you otherwise might not. <clears throat> and this is the final slide. So I know my class had the task of coming up with lots of questions, and hopefully all of you will have questions. Um, so ask away. Yes. Um, it appears to me that a lot of your work, you use a lot of the unknowns of leaving things out, but it seems like some of it seems to be kind of um, in a negative aspect of it, like um, um, uh, I'm not sure how to say it, but like it's 
like the one with the gentleman holding the dog over the hole, it seems like it's kind of hateful or um, negative. Where does that kind of come from? That's a really good point. I think um, when I create work, I know that I have a, an, a meaning or an association behind it, and as I create it, I try and kind of think about all the other sorts of associations that might be drawn amongst those images based on you know, cultural associations with certain things. Um, to me, that image is about burial and the process of renewal. Um, however, obviously, it can be seen in different lights. Um, so some of the images, if they have, uh, I, I mean, I, there's definitely themes of death throughout a lot of them. Um, and I think that's another layer of, a, of association or part of a narrative. Um, that can either be bringing attention to something else as a metaphor, or it might be, to me, about you know the cycle of death and renewal <coughs> as a possibility, too. So, yeah. Yes? What you've shown us thus far, and I'm not otherwise familiar with your work, the imagery is predominantly of male forms. And only one that I remember today that I that was a female form, mm -hmm. and that must have significance, but I don't know what it is. Um, it is something I think about, and again, like the, the piece with the piano player, like I had this original association that I think was drawn out of stereotype and then reconsidered it. Um, one of the things I think about is, and I don't think this is true with a female figure necessarily, but if, well this doesn't actually make sense. Um, I do think about it and often, like if you're, if you're putting a female in a role, it can be read as a feminist statement or something like that. And a lot of my work probably has feminist undertones because I consider myself a feminist. I'll, but I don't think that that's what the work is about outright. So I make those decisions definitely based on what I do want to talk about in the work and also acknowledging that some associations might create a content, or a content that I'm not interested in in that piece. Um, but I think there's, I don't know, there's, there's women flitting around in here, but there's a lot of white men too. Yeah. And the same thing, I think, applies to race, you know? Um, well, it, 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 it started to be distracting for me, though, for hmm. your information. I mean, the, the white males, et cetera, mm -hmm. and just wondering where the rest of the world is. Right. Well, it's interesting. The, uh, the class I have here today is called Art on the Periphery, and it's looking at underrepresented artists and also how underrepresented people have been you know, portrayed in art. Um, so I think that's a good question to entertain across the board. I also don't think it is the responsibility of a female artist to be the, the one who's always, you know, making art of women by any means, too. But I think they're here. Yeah. Justin's pointing. Oh, they're definitely there in the pregnant picture. You can't really have men being pregnant. <laughs> when did you first start doing large scale? I, st I think I've always been inclined to work big. Primarily because when I work small, it ends up being really illustrative and really tight, and I think I have a lot more room to be expressive on a larger scale. Um, in college, I was trying to do some things on large scale, but it would be like three pieces of paper stuck together, and it wasn't really well crafted. And so I think that the idea started there, but it didn't really happen until I was in Montana, where everything is big. <laughs> Emma, how do you deal with the largeness, like moving and? In keeping work, I I found that like every time I move, I think why do I have all this stuff that I don't like? It's all this art, and I made it, and the bigger things seem to get thrown away or mm -hmm. given away, or so, and so I'm just impressed. That, yeah. So the question is about the cumbersome quality of large art. It's definitely a problem, um, <laughs> but I really like it. So until now, until now that I've trained myself to just figure stuff out and smash things in the corners, I was often unrolling my work and restretching it when I'd move and uh, significantly damage some pieces that way. And it's my rule that I'm not allowed to do that anymore. So if anyone has large wall space, let me know. But, you know, can I add something as far as large art mm -hmm. from the gallery point of view is that... Um, when, when the gallery committee looked at Julie's portfolio, we just saw the slides, and things are very different when they're a slide. And when she brought them in here and 
I, I was alone when I unwrapped them, and I was ecstatic because these pieces have so much presence, and the colors are vivid, and things. The composition works differently when it's large than when it's small, and um, I'm I'm delighted to exhibit large pieces, and I, I think the faculty here, when they when they looked at the work, they were delighted to have students. Uh, witness and see large pieces because it's it's a, a bold and brave way to work. And uh, we did have to come up with a coefficient of stretch with the wires mm -hmm. because everything pulls down. So there's some logistics, but um, definitely worth it. Sarah. I'm on working in working this large, when you're using reference material that's just these small photographs, how do you work with like like having the right proportions or scale when you blow it up to seven by nine? So the question is on a large scale of work, and I'm looking at these little photographs part of the time for references, um, how do I enlarge it? I do a lot of drawing on the gesso canvas before I put any paint on it. So although I'm not doing a small scale drawing and gridding it off to then enlarge it. I move stuff around and repaint just over it so I get an idea of where stuff's going to go. For the first time, starting with my abstract painting class, which I trained, um, I don't know what's going on. Um, I actually have started projecting some components of my most recent paintings. But again, it's to get a rough sketch down, and then often I'm working with composites of multiple things to make one form. So then I'll move stuff around. I'll still do a lot of painting over and redrawing with that. So. You allocate time to it to, to set up a particular oh. schedule in your life experience? Really good question. So what is my painting schedule? Um, I work best when I can just start on a painting and keep working on it. If I just work on it once a week, it tends to, you know, I'm definitely not in the mode and things happen and I get frustrated. Um, the teaching schedule is really nice in the fact that you have summers or large blocks of time. And then I'll, you know, it's most workable if I just do drawings over shorter times or work on prepping canvases. But I do feel like I need chunks of time to be most How successful. How much time? To do a painting? Yes. Um, with, it's not here, the um, piano painting. That's a painting where I wasn't working at the time and I wrote down in <clears> my... Um, calendar of the day I had the model come and photographed her. So I had the research done, I had the reference materials, and then it took a month to complete the piece. So about a month, but three months if I'm working or teaching. Eric? Yeah, I noticed in your slides you had a lot of graves and dark holes. Mm -hmm. Are you still painting graves and digging holes? I am. I really, okay, that's a good question. And this kind of goes back to the, the burial question. I am kind of fascinated with holes and mounds of things in painting, and I think part of it is a kind of a, I don't know, formal or conceptual thing. I really like the idea of taking a flat canvas that's, you know, flat color and making a hole in it. And it's really challenging and really rewarding. I, I like the lumps and holes association. So maybe, you know, I don't know. It's just a, I don't know what this other, the other symbolism of that is, but it's okay. Yes. Um, I'm curious, you had mentioned for a few of your paintings that you have done like research to um, the topic before painting it, mm -hmm. but I was wondering where your inspiration usually comes from, like if it comes from a life experience that inspires you to research that project, or just reading about it? Yeah, I think it's actually more removed than, the life, than, than my personal experience. A lot of things are, you know, um, through, based on my education or things like that. Um, I think the types of objects I pick out are based on my personal life or things I have or things I'm attracted to, but the, the overall themes I think are um, more like social or removed or elements, things I've read about in either you know, novels or literature or history. Good question. Yes. When you have different resource material, you have a model here, a photograph there, your lighting is going to be different in each of those. How do you make it in your paintings so that everything is in the same room, you know, on the painting? I'm glad you think it is. <laughs> I'm not sure that it is. Um, but that is, you know, it, I think that has a lot to do with 
again, reworking the drawings and considering how things would work in space. And I've done a lot of like figure drawing and things like that to get a sense of how things work in three-dimensional space. And from a teaching perspective, I think it's really important to learn how to draw from life before working from photographs so you can apply those things that you've learned about volume and um, source of light and depth of space to that. Um, it is challenging, though, when I make these flat backgrounds, you know, that definitely stops the depth of space. And um, I guess I just let it stop, but that's fine for now. But, yeah, Iris. You mentioned that some of your early inspirations were when you were taking American studies, mm -hmm. and that they came from American literature, I thought I heard you say. And I was just wondering, like, I, I really like the visual um, references that you gave us, and I was wondering what some of the, like, non-visual inspirations that were pivotal for you mm -hmm. were. Can, you might want to repeat Yeah, that. so Iris's question is a good one. Um, so talking about, like, the themes I'm dealing with, or references, um, that a lot of stuff, you know, came out of American history on some level, but also I have visual references, so what are some of my, like, literary references or things? And I don't know that I have many specifics, but I like the way... Um, in literature, draw it makes metaphors or associations. Um, so writers like John Steinbeck, I was a big fan of. For, I'm still a big fan of, but I was reading a lot of John Steinbeck for a while. Um, yeah, I'm not coming up with specific authors, but just the style, you know, how writing can draw associations or allegories, I guess. Yeah. Would you like to just explain some of these stories? Have you been to Africa? Have you seen the Cape and Buffalo? Or? I have not. No, I have not. Um, so they're not narratives. Sorry about this. Maybe this go away. Um, so the question is, you know, have I seen these things in real life? And again, um, no. And there, are, a lot of these aren't, you know, depictions of a specific place, but they're more drawing associations or connections between the. Or, yeah, it's it's associative. That's not answering that well at all. Um, the, I don't think having, when I'm dealing with elephants in the piece it's, I'm not talking about Africa specifically yet I'm using an element that we consider exotic from an American perspective to talk about American society so if I were trying to make a statement about Africa I would hope that I would be able to get a grant and go to Africa for the research component of that, yeah, like that. but yeah I would love that <laughs> <laughs> but right now I'm dealing with uh, I think more specific American types of concerns. Good question. Yes. I get the feeling that you think about something for quite a while before you actually start painting. The, yes. Um, the question was, do I think about something for a long time before I start the painting? I do. And part of that's because I find if I rush into something, a lot of times I just realize it's a bad idea. And I end up redoing it or something. Um, and part of it's a time issue. You know, once I have an idea, there's a lot of process behind I, you know, I make my own stretcher bars, stretch the canvas, stretch the canvas. So that takes a while. So that's part of the process in time. I like to do that myself because it's becoming invested in what I'm doing and thinking about it. Also part of the, um, when I'm looking for reference images, I'll come across something that will change the idea. So there's a lot of development in there. And yes. secondly, how many <coughs> things do you have on the back burner now to look forward to doing in the future? I have one more or less resolved idea and a bunch of little things that are coming together. So, one that I'm ready to go on. Yeah. Are you planning to continue the work with elephants? Yeah, the, ele the question is, am I continuing the elephant work, which is more or less the stuff in that back section is the newer work. Um, and um, not necessarily just the elephants, but continuing this theme of um, looking at our notions of the exotic to put that into a full body of work that can be an exhibit on its own. Yes? What's the necess necessary, all uh, the pre-planning that you do, um, being necessary in your personality, what surprises come during the process of the painting itself? That's a good point, and I don't know if I can articulate it. A lot. I mean, I, I make a lot of visual decisions that aren't, that are, based on formal concerns rather than the subject matter. So whether it's, you know, high range stuff or <clears throat> colors or stuff. But a lot of stuff changes there. Um, How about the psychological, um, emotional 
feelings that you're personally dealing with, you're getting ahas as you paint. Right. Uh, are those surprises that so much is going to be planned, or does that happen during the pre planning? I think it happens both. I think while I'm painting, I'm obviously I'm getting those ahas about upcoming stuff, and that's what's exciting if I can like be doing something and it leads to something else. Um, those are the good points, definitely. I mean, yeah, I guess that's kind of why I do it, and I definitely can't articulate it. Um, good surprises are fun, and it's funny too because sometimes I'll be working and I'll think I'll like look at something and think it's great, and then two days later it's not great anymore. But that moment of greatness was pretty fun, you know, and we move on, so, yes. It kind of seems to me that when you say our notions of the exotic, mm -hmm. I wonder who you refer to by our, our probably the wealthy elite, mm -hmm. um, the exotic, are you suggesting that the exotic is fed by more vulnerable, more vulnerable species, whether it's man or animal? Mm -hmm. I guess I think, and again, I'm, st I'm still in the beginnings of this research project. I guess I think that um, there's a demand for the exotic. And I do by us or we mean um, the dominant Western culture that's supporting that demand. But I don't necessarily mean like rich white male by that. But I mean the culture that's been established that um, keeps that cycle yeah, going. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yes. What does the notion of exotic mean to you? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now you don't have to go way in depth. Yeah. No, I guess. Psychological, spiritual, yeah. emotional, physical. Um, but not in depth. But, but not, not in depth. depth. Just, pick that's a, that's a <laughs> Just pick an area. Yeah. Uh, no, I think as far as a definition to me of the exotic, it is asking someone to. Um, embody characteristics, characteristics of a culture that we, um, not that we, yeah, to embody characteristics of a culture that they otherwise might not um, in their roles of entertainment or servitude overall. That's really brief. <laughs> Iris. Do you ever find something in a finished piece of yours that you didn't expect or you didn't intend? My mother finds those things. The question is, <laughs> if it, there's ever something in the piece that I didn't see or intend, my mother always comes up to things and she'll be like, look, did you intend for that little face to show up there? And there's no, I'm hoping there's no face there. And I can never look at the piece again without seeing what my mother's seeing. Um, <laughs> but it's not always my mother. Oftentimes someone else will point those things out, um, but usually it's someone else that has to point out to me, which is really good. I mean, it's like a critique in that someone else is seeing something different and then to recognize it and decide whether or not to keep it or change it. You know, if it works with the content, it works. Yeah. Yes, Emma. Critiques, like, so you're not in a school setting anymore. Do you get together with other artists and critique each other's work, or do you? Another really good question. So back there, um, do I participate in, you know, group critiques? I don't, and I kind of wish I did. However, I feel like um, teaching for me and participating in streets with students all the time enables me to go home and look at my own work and kind of set myself up for that, to be like, okay, I'm trying to put on my blinders. What types of things could come out of this? What's working? And kind of go through the same process. Um, however, if I had other people, I, mean, I would definitely be more objective. Um, and my close friends or family are helpful with that, too but I don't like participate in community critiques yet. Any other questions? Okay. Um, if you have other questions you want to ask me one-on-one, -on -one, I'll be here for a little bit. But otherwise, if you haven't had a chance yet, um, walk around and look at some stuff.